Okay, ladies and gentlemen, my pleasure to introduce uh, teachers at Carroll of Washington College in Chicago, Illinois, and has uh, come down here to perform a concert tonight at the Unitarian Universalist Church, part of their jazz series, the Four Seasons of Jazz. He's playing with some people you might be familiar with, Travis Shaw on bass, and Edwin Hamilton on drums, and then some of our students opening act, um, Jordan, Deshaun, and Cole, John Kirk, they both should be in here right now. Actually, I know where Jordan's at. Oh, you can tell me about that later. Um, and Stanley. Anyway, so if you can't come to the concert tonight, it starts at 7.30, right? Unitarian Church is right across the street from the big First Baptist, next door to the fire station where Walt went and Walt went extension meet. And uh, yes, just come in and have your seat. And uh, so anyway, it's Matt Shevitz, Dr. Matt Shevitz. I know he's also uh, written some articles, um, work, still uh, doing work with the College Music Society. Mm -hmm. He's an editor there. So I'm not gonna say any more about him because I think part of what he's gonna do in addition to talk about improv is give sort of an idea of many possible ways you end up where you are in life because <laughs> um, um, it's always interesting to find you know you think you're going to do one thing when you start out and you know you come to some different paths and make different choices and options are presented so we'll let him talk more about himself talk about improv get some questions from you but dr matt shevitz warmer here than in Chicago. I know it's still cold, but in Chicago we have a wind chill that's below zero right now. So this feels kind of nice. More kind of cozy, open, and I'm awfully comfortable. Not feeling like the wind is just hurting when it blows in my face. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have been up in that area, but it can. I, I don't think that uh, once it gets below five degrees that it feels all that different, five to 30 below is pretty much the same, it's just how. So, it's nice to be here. I thought I'd start things off just by playing a quick tune for you guys. Um, does anybody have anything that they would like to hear? See if you know it. Thank you. 
specific theoretical concepts, as Dr. Foster mentioned, I've written some articles for Downbeat Magazine, ranging from how to practice more effectively, which I find to be very, very important, um, to certain concepts like how to use triad pairs a little more effectively in your improvisation, and how you can apply them to different chords. Really what they are, if you're not familiar with what a triad pair is. So is there anything you guys and really wanting to hear another perspective on or add another question. Yeah. Um, what is a good time to set on chords? Mm. When you're reading a chart, what is a good interpretation of when you should stack on the So when you're stacking, you're you're providing more tension, right, in order to get to a resolution. So I think it really depends on the context. What's happening in the rhythm section? Listening to the rhythm section is really important and thinking about where your melodic line is going. So the way I look at it is there's a few, there, there's really three areas within a phrase where you can apply some tension um, and some resolution. So if we just take something like a good old 251, are we all familiar with the 251? Okay. <laughs> each chord there's the two, five, and then the one. So if we look at those three chords, there's really three areas where we can provide tension. You can do it at the beginning. So there I've got the tension right at the beginning, and then I go to a much more consonant sound. Something like that, right? You can do it in the middle, which is probably the most common approach. Uh, I remember in my undergrad, my jazz theory professor would always say five is where the fun is. So you can go from two to five and you can alter the five chord and stack and do whatever it is that, that you want to do. Over that and then move to the resolution. Uh, right, so there's that, that tension right in the middle. Then you move to it. And then, of course, you can just end with the tension, which can be a little tricky. At times, you have to have some, well, a certain level of trust, I would say, with the rhythm section. Um, and really be aware of what it is that you're ignoring. You know that you're not resolving this the way um, the textbooks say that it should be resolved. You know, it can be fun to play out and alter things and provide that tension. Uh, but if you don't know how to properly resolve your, your melodies, then there's a certain depth that 
that can be missing. So some people say, well, I, I, I play out and I just hear it that way. And that works for some folks, but a very, very small percentage. Most of the time, if you want to be able to take things out, then you need to know how to play inside first. Let me play, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Let me give you an example of a line that ends with tension. <laughs> sound like it has all that much tension maybe when I'm playing on my own. If I just hit a good old chord and ignore my wonderful voicing here, but you know. There's, you can hear more tension there. Miles Davis has a, a quote that I just came across not too long ago that I Never start an idea on the beat. You should never end a phrase to finish it. That was from the You know, leave it hanging. And, and when you listen to some of the more contemporary players, I would say really from the last 30 years, they tend to have strict tempos. Right? You can hear that in their, in their phrases. They tend to ending their phrases with something that might sound like it's the first half of a phrase. So, yeah. Well, what's the other, <clears throat> excuse me, the other part I heard, though, uh, was he said that, but then he said he left the room, so it's finished. Oh. Did I make it ending? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that relationship with the rhythm section is one that's really important. Sometimes playing along with recording is a fantastic way to learn, and I do it all the time. I don't have a rhythm section that lives in my house. I mean, I have two kids, but they're 10 and 6. I can't put that kind of pressure on them. I don't want that. And, hey, you're dragging. Yeah. Right? I'm not interested in being a Leopold Mozart. Uh, so I play along with recordings a fair amount, but I always make sure that when I'm playing with live people that I really listen to. Yeah, letting the rhythm section finish your phrase. It's, it's a great way of doing that. So, but still, Miles is thinking of all of these things as, from a standpoint of someone who is really worked on playing inside. So let me go back to that. Um, when you take something like stacking chords or just using a different scale, so some of you who took the jazz improv class, you discussed the Mixolydian mode. Yes? Um, for those of you who aren't aware, is there anyone here who maybe needs a quick refresher on what the Mixolydian mode is? So I'll just give you a little bit of a refresher. <laughs> a la Mixolydian mode. Um, sure. So you're all familiar with major and minor scales, yes? And minor scales are just a different way of playing the major scale. Saxophone C major. And I started on A. I get a different sound. Yes? Yes. Alright. Mixolydian is the same thing. Okay? Except in starting, instead of starting on the sixth, A, I'm playing that C major scale by starting on G. C major, um, I'm just starting in a different spot. And by doing that, I get a slightly different sound. So, let me throw this up on the board real quick. So, let's say I have this chord. What is this chord? G dominant seven. G dominant seven. So, these are the notes that are in that chord. And the Mixolydian scale works really well because if I just play from G to G with C major key signature, everything works, right? All of the notes that are in the chord are in the scale, everybody's happy. The notes that are between the chord tones are still fine, they work really well. Okay. 
This is a concept. This is a basic concept. This is something that we start out with when we're learning how to improvise. Where I'm going with this is that when you're stacking chords, when you're doing something where you're changing the scale, you may be doing something that throws in some alterations. I'm going to alter this as much as I can, okay? So I'm going to do something like, um, I'm just going to throw some flats up here. That was the best. I threw some flats up there. All right, so that scale, I just went from doing something <coughs> still a concept and so one of the things that gets some folks in trouble is that they, they say well I want to play out and they just hear it that way and you can play outside and provide tension without a theoretical concept behind it but it's a little more effective and you'll have more material under your fingers if you have something that you're kind of basing it off of so rather than just playing and saying well I'm gonna just I'm gonna play these notes and I'm gonna have that clash with the chord, if I'm thinking of this particular scale, then I have a little more that I can work with. You know, I can pull more melodic ideas from a scale than I can from just a few random notes. And it's always a concept. So I've had students come in and they want to play and they want to you know, they want to do giant steps or some tune with a lot of chords that are moving very fast. But when they play the blues, they have a hard time playing the blues and really bringing out the chord changes. So we have to go all, we have to go back and say, well, let's focus on playing a simpler chord progression and having you stay inside the concept. Because if you can't stay inside the concept for something that's a simpler chord progression, then how are you going to do it when you're playing over something that moves really fast or has a more challenging? It's all the same thing. The idea is that you're so focused on staying in the concept that the concepts might get more complicated, but you're still having that mentality. So when you're applying this or any sort of chord stacking or anything, you're staying inside that concept. Because that's really what's going to make you playing this scale over this chord effective, is that you stay inside that, that concept. But as far as when you stack chords, it's all intuitive, right? It's all a vocabulary. It's like what I'm doing now. I have no script, but I have a vocabulary that helps me communicate. Now, I've spent most of my time, and I'm going to ask a question again in a second, but let me just say this. I've spent most of my time focusing on a harmonic vocabulary rather than a melodic vocabulary. I've definitely spent some time with some melodic ideas, but for something like this, you know, there are certain licks, as we would call them, certain phrases that you would play that, that can use that concept. That's great. But one of my favorite quotes is from this um, saxophonist named Frank West. Anybody heard of Frank West? He's a fantastic player. I got to have a lesson with him once. Uh, there were two big things I learned from that lesson. One was, was um, Frank's quote saying, if you study out of the same book, you get the same answer. So learning the same kind of licks is going to give you the same licks when you're playing. Now, that being said, when I teach jazz improv, yeah, I have certain things that I'm teaching people. Because there's a common vocabulary, right? We're not communicating with each other now by just saying random words. OK, 
okay? And, you know, like when I when my kids were younger, they said some random word, I, I had to translate it a little bit. I didn't just speak it back, right? And they've learned now to use a common vocabulary. But at the same time, you also want to give yourself some freedom. Focus on what's the theory behind this? What's, what's really going on with this harmonically? So instead of thinking, I'm gonna play this lick, I'm gonna play this phrase over this particular chord, instead I'm thinking, I'm gonna use this particular scale, this particular approach over the chord. Okay, and that kind of opens, opens you up. So I'll, I'll share real quick the other thing that I learned from the Frank Bless lesson. I was playing a song for him, he was like, well, why don't you just play something for me? And this is a guy that played with the Count Basie Orchestra for 30 years or so. I mean, it was a little intimidating, to say the least. Um, I started playing, and he starts tapping. And he's tapping on what I feel is one and three. So in jazz, we really em emphasize two and four. And I thought, oh my gosh. I totally turned the beat around <laughs> in front of this amazing musician what do I, and I just kept going. I got done playing and I asked him, I said, were you, were you tapping on two and four? Did I just totally screw that up? And he said, no, I was tapping on one and three. <sighs> Normally tapping on one and three, that's considered not being very hip, right? But I asked him why, he said, well, the time is on one and three, the groove is on two and four. Now Frank, is an, was an older player, so you could get someone like trumpeter Freddie Hubbard who would say, well, no, it's all about two and four, and you can keep time on two and four there as well. Frank's approach, and this is a fairly common one, is the time is on one and three. You feel the groove on two and four. He said, if you can't one, you can't two. That was nice. All right, any other questions? Yeah. He's kind of given a little bit of an approach to actually uh, addressing the chords themselves, but what about your approach on connecting your melody to the performance when it changes, like literally through the, the progression? Yeah. So when you're moving through, so there's there's a couple of things with that. When you're moving through a chord progression, if it's a finite two, five, one, <coughs> that can be sometimes a little easier because you're staying, you're staying in the same Although sometimes I think that's a little more challenging, just because you've got to make that new chord sound fresh. Um, the best voices to resolve. Okay, put a pen in there. I'll grab this one. Thank goodness there's two. So the best voices to resolve to, in my opinion, are the third and the fifth of any chord. Um, and I think when you're really getting into improvising thinking about how to connect one chord to another, thinking about moving to that third or fifth is the best way for you to go. Taking some time when you're playing to think about how you're gonna head there, rather than just plowing through and playing a bunch of notes and hoping that you land on that third or fifth when the chord changes. It's not gonna be as helpful. You wanna take some time Give yourself some space and play a very deliberate idea um, in order to land on that. The root, this is going to be played by the bass, right? So you can hit it. It's not like you know the jazz police are going to come out of nowhere and arrest you. Oh, you you played the root of that chord. That's not okay. I know uh, you may have heard this. I don't know um, in jazz improv that. You don't want to play the root, and it's true. We have to tell students who are starting out that, because if we don't, then they're going to play the root so much, because they're going to think G7, G, and they're going to be focused on that. And they have to think beyond that, and think about the other, the other uh, notes in the core, and trying to get them to, to avoid that, uh, that em emphasizing of the, of the root. So you say, well, don't, don't play the root. But I can show you all sorts of transcriptions from great musicians. Coltrane, Sonny Stitt, anybody you want. And they they hit the root, they hit it on beat one of the bar, and it sounds fantastic. 
But they're also, at other points in their solo, they're also playing other notes within the chord. Yeah. And that's the idea there. You don't want to just rely on the key. So, um, but really the third and the fifth, the bass is playing the root. The seventh works fine. You can, you can do that, but what really is going to help bring out that chord is, is the third and fifth. And one thing that you can do in order to just get yourself familiar with landing on the third and the fifth of a chord is playing some enclosures. You guys ever talk about enclosures? Very simple. Um, so I'm gonna take I'm gonna take just the triad of this chord. Okay? And an enclosure, let's say we do it around the fifth. Alright? That's slot. There's our fifth. So if I play a note a half step above it, and I play a note, oops, I squished it too much, sorry. Well, I play a note a half step below it, and then I go to the actual note. Okay, what I've done is that I've basically surrounded this note that I'm heading to. I've gone from above, the below and then to the note. Okay, so that's why we call it an enclosure. It's a pretty logical term. So, and you can take that just for the triads to let's say two five one, and just go through each voice. So maybe, and if I'm going up to two, which relates to my chord, it's going to sound like this. sound more interesting for you to move to a chord and not just have it be diatonic. Um, so rather than just going, oh, that's a nice chord, but that's not what I meant to play. Rather than doing something like that. Right, which is just moving down a scale. theory, right? Chromaticism, good old chromaticism. Doesn't matter if it's jazz or if it's classical, if you're dealing with, you know, chromaticism in romantic era music. It's all to make it sound pretty chill. So, I know some of you 
are here and are not necessarily implemented. So I do want to make sure I talk a little bit about how I got to be standing or sitting on a stool in front of you. Uh, and also about effective practicing too. That's something I've been thinking about quite a lot. So let me start with, with that. Um, I'll, I'll just close this by saying stay focused on those, on those notes. Especially the third and fifth, and think about staying inside the concept. And then it's just a matter of adding new concepts to your vocabulary. Right? So that's very important too. Practicing. Practicing is also very important, something that we're all doing here, right? We all practice our instruments. We don't, not all jazzers, but we are all people who practice. I taught ear training for seven years at Harold Washington College. I only stopped because they roped me into being department chair. Uh, and then I had to drop some classes. So I was like, well, I'll have to let those go. So now I'm just doing jazz history, general music appreciation, and the combos. Um, but through teaching saxophone lessons, through teaching Improvisation and through teaching ear training is yeah, it's very important. I, I really started thinking a lot more about how people practice, especially ear training. Let's face it, it's not everybody's favorite class, right? Is anybody in your favorite class? <laughs> Liar. No, I'm just, it could very well be your favorite class. Um, and your, your professor is probably great at it. But it's, it's not something that everyone jumps to, right? But it's really important. It's really important because you're musicians. And if you're going into education or even conducting or whatever, or composing, you need to be able to hear the art that you're contributing to or helping to create and really hear how things relate to each other. Or we have a, a fair amount of students who are interested in becoming recording artists and they're going into like the, the recording program well, as engineers, it's very helpful if you can point something out and say, you know, that person was playing a major chord and everyone else is playing a minor chord and it really clashes. So there you just made yourself an invaluable engineer, right? Someone that is worth whatever it is that you're charging. Uh, but people don't always practice ear training. They be they don't want to work on their side singing. They don't want to work on their dictation because it's not as fun. But you need to because it's oral skills, right? It's not a lecture course. It's one that you do need to practice, but you need to practice effectively. So there are some things that you can do to practice effectively uh, and make sure that you're getting the most out of your time. I know when I was in school, out of school, I'm going to have so much time to practice, it's going to be great. I have no time to practice now, because I've got to write this paper, I've got to do this assignment, and I've got to do this and that and this and that. I've got no time. And then I graduated, and then I realized, oh my gosh, I didn't have, I had all the time <laughs> when I was in school. Now I have no time, because now i really got to be focused on looking for jobs, doing my job, and then I do the job and then I've got to practice at, at night for a little bit, stay fresh so that I can play gigs when people ask me to play gigs. And then I had kids. <laughs> now I can practice and I get the, he hit me kind of stuff. <laughs> or he won't watch the show that I want to watch. We just watched his show. And then hear the, she's lying in the background. <laughs> um, you know. I get that. Or I get a phone call and it's like, well, we've got this issue down at school. Or it, it could be any number of things. So you got to make your practicing more effective. So one of the things that you need to do is, to, of course, always play things at a comfortable tempo, right? But make sure that you're really thinking about whatever it is. Now, this isn't just improv. This is uh, going for written music as well. If you're working on concertos and want to make sure that you're playing at, at a comfortable tempo, you want to make sure 
that you're not just ignoring mistakes. Take some time to think about those mistakes. Because practicing isn't just wiggling your finger. In fact, most of it's up here, right? Most of it's thinking about the music and understanding it, because that's gonna translate. Now, part of it is definitely muscle memory. We've gotta keep that in mind. That's where a lot of our frustration comes from. We understand what it is we're supposed to play, but the muscle memory is not there. And so, since the muscle memory is not there, we make mistakes and then we get frustrated because the brain's going, what are you doing? And the hands are like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, we get frustrated. You've gotta make sure you take some time to build that muscle memory. You've gotta keep that in mind that you have to build that muscle memory. And then you've gotta make sure that you're doing it correctly. So if you play something and you make a mistake, then you want to make sure that before you're done practicing, you don't have to stop immediately, because that can develop that bad habit of always stopping when you make a mistake. Just going back to my experience as an ear training instructor, it used to drive me nuts for sight singing. People would sing two notes and then they would stop. And they'd start again and sing the same two notes and they'd stop. And it took hours to do sight singing. Um, but uh, you do want to make sure that you go over it because what you want to make sure you do is that you play the, the phrase, the concept, whatever it is, while you're thinking about how that is the right way to play it. Because what's going to happen is after you're done practicing, after you totally pack up and you're off and you're you know eating pizza or whatever it is, even watching the championship football, college football game that's this Monday. Go Ducks! That's my school. Um, sorry. We're kind of excited that they're in the championship. Your brain is going to be thinking about what it was that you were practicing. It's going to be processing the information. And you want to make sure to process it correctly. So go back and play it. Even if you're playing it really slow, play it and make sure that you're doing it correctly so that when your brain is processing things, it's processing the correct information and not the mistake. Right? That's really important. Think about what it's going to feel like to play a particular phrase. Just think about it, especially improvisers who think, over this chord, I'm going to use this scale. This is how that works. If I'm doing it over this tune, it's going to pop up in these moments when I can really use that scale. So you take some time to think about that. Because otherwise you're just wiggling your finger. And you're not able to apply it when you're improvising. If you're working on written music, you think, okay, so that's gonna go here, there, if it's piano, um, or whatever it might be, saxophone, clarinet. You know, you're thinking about how it's gonna feel to play something and what your fingers are gonna have to do in order to do that. Then that's gonna make playing it easier. It might be in that same session, it might be the next day, but you're building those connections and, and reinforcing that information that this is how that's going to feel so that the muscle memory gets developed more and your practicing is just much more effective. Yeah. Rather than just going in and plowing through a whole bunch of stuff and then going through the next day, plowing through it again and not really making much progress. If you take some time to just focus on one thing for a little bit, then it's beneficial. And an effective practice session is one where you improve on anything, no matter how small. You can walk away saying, well, I got better at this one phrase. Great. Great. That's an effective practice session. Of course, we want it to be a little more significant, but if that's all it is, then that's all it is. You gotta make sure you do it. And the other thing is, you've gotta do a daily warm up. Let's see an honest show of hands. Who does a daily warm up? Yeah, okay. It's amazing the difference. See, for me, I've gotta make sure I get in 10, 15 minutes at least a day because if I've got kids knocking on the door or I'm just swamped with work or maybe it's, there are definitely days where you're getting up in the morning, getting the kids, to school, then you go into work, then you're coming home, or going straight from work to a gig, and 
work is so crazy that you don't have time to practice. You gotta find 10 or 15 minutes, sometimes it's in the morning for me, um, and I'm following kids around like, okay, go brush your teeth. All right, now go get dressed. <laughs> Okay. Just to make sure I'm getting in some time playing, just to do a little warm up. For, my warm up has changed. When I wrote the article for Downbeat that was in this last October issue, it was to play four scales, two to three octaves on the saxophone, because I wanted to work on my altissimo as well, um, in four different ways. So not just going around the circle of fifths or the circle of fourths, but moving chromatically, the roots of each scale chromatically, moving by whole steps, third, fourth, just in different ways. So I didn't fall into a pattern of going straight from C to F, or straight from C to G, because I know that's where you're going around. And doing that warm up every day, every day, even when I'm totally exhausted, I'm like, okay, I just gotta get through this. And keeping in mind that I'm exhausted, and that's gonna result in some mistakes, maybe going a little slower. Um, that is so beneficial. You get such a better connection with your instrument. And playing your ideas as an improviser or just playing in general is just so much more fluid. It's a lot easier. So just take 10, 15 minutes a day to do a warm up. Figure out a good warm up for you that gets you comfortable. And for those of you who are in ear training, just do five or 10 minutes of ear training a day. That's all you have to do. A little bit see a lot of results because you're, you're doing things on a daily basis and if you're doing them effectively then you're really going to make some progress. I have a ton. I have tens. It's amazing that they're all awake. That's good. Look, before I talk about where or what, what the, the path for me was like, we have to one? Or are we um, done? Technically now? we're done but it's Oh. Suck. How many have to go right away? I got three other gigs. <laughs> and there, also, there's a rehearsal at one, right? Oh, so right. okay. Can we say five more minutes down? Sure. Okay. So let me see then if there are any questions. Yeah. How do you do ear training alone? Ooh, good question. There are some great resources now. Um, probably the, the one that I'm the most familiar with is a website. Does anybody know Teoria? Have you ever heard of that? It's an ear training website. We've started using it in our curriculum. Um, just to help people practice. We've used ear training software. There's, it's the one, Aralia, if I'm remembering right. Um, or there's McGammit. Like my students used to call it McGammit. Uh, <laughs> they would get so frustrated. Teoria is nice. I, I don't like the harmonic dictation as much, but um, it's free and has a bunch of great exercises. There's also a whole bunch of apps uh, that people have really jumped on the, the ear training bandwagon for tech stuff. Other questions? Oh, I know you have them. Almost? No? You're like my students, you're like deer in, in headlights. Like, don't move. You won't think I have a question. I'm just going to stare. <laughs> right? All right, fine. Look, folks, there's a lot of talk in higher ed today about what college graduates are going to be doing with their degrees. And there are, you know, the media has a knack for finding those students that want to complain the loudest and saying that this is representative of everybody. I understand the concern. I want to share with you a little bit about how I got to where I am today. To give you the perspective that you've really got to just pursue opportunities and stay connected with the field. Because when your dream job comes up, chances are the experience you've gained by doing other things connected with the field is going to come in handy. They're going to be like, well, they're qualified to do this position, but then they've also done X, Y, and Z, and that could really help our organization way they look for those things. I started out my senior year of college this is sounds weird this is how I started my career so I didn't know what I was gonna do and I got a call from a freshman who was still in a high school honors big band 
he asked me if I would sub for him for a gig for this concert. He offered to pay me 60 bucks. I said, I'll pay you 60 bucks, but I'm like, okay, fine. I'm in college, I can use 60 bucks. Um, I've used 60 bucks now. Um, but regardless, I needed it then, so I played it. Guess who was leading the big band? Someone I knew. I knew the guy leading it, and he said, hey, what are you doing in January? We're gonna start up a new quarter. You wanna teach a jazz improv class? I said, sure, I wanna teach a jazz improv class. Let's do that. So I started teaching for them, and I teach for them until I graduate. I graduate, and they say, we'd like for you to come in the office and work 10 hours a week. I think you could do that, and you can also teach. Sure. And then I said, wait, <laughs> 10 hours is too little. And I was literally, I was looking at doing that plus construction work because I, was, I just wanted to stay connected with music, right? And then I said, well, I need to work more than that. They were able to find some hours for me. But then I got to a point where I thought, I really just need a little bit more of a job. I, was, I actually interviewed for a job as, um, at a bank. But in between that first and second interview, we had our two-week music festival that we did every year. The jazz advisor for that festival was a fantastic pianist named Dick Hyman. And Dick and Bucky Pizzarelli and, oh my gosh, what is his name? I'm having a hard, I'm blanking on, on one name. But the three of them, so they, they were doing this, uh, where I got to play with them. I got to, because I was working in the office and I needed someone to play baritone sax, so I played baritone sax. I played for them. And then afterwards we go out to dinner and I'm thinking there's no way that I can sit around with these fantastic musicians who have played with all sorts of people if I'm working at a bank. This is where I want to be. I want to stay connected with it. And through pursuing opportunities like that, remember this all started with me just subbing for some kid. <laughs> in a, with a high school honor thing. But through pursuing things and seeing where they would lead, I've gotten to do quite a lot. And through just being happy with staying connected <coughs> with music, I've been, you know, it led to me uh, working for that festival full time and doing all sorts of things. And then I decided to go and get my master's. So I get my master's and then I'm teaching here and there and all over the place. And then I get hired at a college full time and, you know, 12 later, I'm the chair of the department, I mean, it's, it's worked out well, and I've gotten to play with some fantastic musicians through some random occurrences there. So I would encourage you to explore opportunities, I would encourage you to always stay connected with the music, because when that dream gig pops up, they're really going to want to see that you were there, that you were connected, doing something musical, and not just like, screw this, I'm working at Starbucks, and only doing that, and nothing else musical. You know, if it's between that applicant and someone who's been doing something, whether it's teaching one private student or playing for, uh, you know, a weekly gig at, at, for church service or just doing, you know, gigs here and there, whatever it might be, just something, they're going to go for that person that stayed connected because that person shows the drive. That person shows the passion for, for the field, okay? At least on paper. You might have it but you've got to show it on paper, okay? All right, I'm so tired, so thank you so much. The Unitarian Church at 730, we're doing the music of Blue Note Records, which will be a lot of fun, and it's gonna be opening up, so feel free to come. I think student tickets are, what, around 10 bucks? Dr. Foster sitting in as well. Thanks. All right.